in all positive and negative splitting. That's the four A's. Uh, the nature of the splitting in the two conditions. The splitting and mul multiplicity. I mean, a person is split. There's five altars. Or in the case of Sybil, there were 16 altars. In the case of Jean, we'll talk about begin beginning next time, there were six altars. In the case of Eve, the famous case of Eve, there were three, four, but then the therapist screwed up the whole therapy and took advantage of her and hurt her really badly. She went on to ev eventually develop 22. And maybe you don't know about that. There's a famous book called I'm Eve, which was a, the patient's own sequel to the original book, The Three Faces of Eve, which told a nice story of the integration. It was a lie. And a mo Hollywood movie was made about it. It was a lie, based on a lie. And the patient fell apart and developed 22 personalities. Very interesting to follow up on that. So there can be an indefinite number number there. But what is this splitting all about? It is not a person falling apart. It's the result of a coping strategy. You turn yourself into something, something, into someone something hasn't happened to. Horrific, traumatic things that can't be taken in. They occurred anyway. You become somebody it didn't happen to. That's dissociation. And it, it repeats and it repeats and repeats. That's what it comes from. So the fragmentation, the splitting apart that's there is a secondary effect of a coping strategy. It's a survival mechanism, okay? It may cause you all kind of problem later, as, as any kind of dissociation will, but it's, you're, but it's, it's, it's not a breakdown of dissociation, it's a breaking up in order to survive. So it's secondary in that sense to coping. In so-called schizophrenia, the fragmentation is, is an annihilation state. It's, it's, the, it's like the glue that holds a person together is failing. And one is breaking into pieces and it's the end. It's, it feels like the end of any kind of coherent life at all. The uh, multiple doesn't experience anything like the end of coherent life. They just, the alters just come and go. And each one is quite coherent. But a so-called schizophrenic feels himself breaking apart and tries to hold it all together. Maybe he or she puts on multiple sets of clothing like my famous first case in this class, to sort of hold the fragmenting pieces together and reestablish a containing boundary that will ensure the integrity of the of this sense of self, but like that famous woman that wore the multiple sets of clothing that we talked about. So I have something written over here on the board. This, a student of mine said this once, and I thought it was brilliant. He said, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the following statement be true, George? A multiple a dissociative identity disorder wants more than anything else in the world to stay apart. Yes, because by staying apart, you don't face the tidal wave of trauma that hit your life in all of its individual parts. You fight to stay in pieces. You want to be that way. There's safety in numbers. It's, it's really what it is. A, a so-called schizophrenic, on the other hand, in a fragmentation annihilation state, wants to come together. He feels that the, the final destruction of his or her own selfhood and world, the self and the world are felt to just fall to pieces. And, and so all kinds of uh, symptoms are created that have a meaning of trying to pull the thing back together in some way. So it's really a wonderful summary of the difference. A multiple wants to stay apart, a schizophrenic wants to come together. What is the cause? This is where some of my stories, I'll maybe just give you two, just to, just to round off your morning as we come up on the noon and help you have a nice lunch. All right. Uh, the cause, it lies in trauma. But the sorts of traumas that are involved in the generation of multiplicity are so bad that it challenges our capacity to believe that human beings would be capable of doing such things to children. And one hears story after story after story that are like that. And you want to deny that it's possible and to believe that it's made up. And often the patient wants to deny that it's the, mem the memories that are coming are true and wants to believe he or she is making it up out of for some sick reason. I, how many times have I heard that? But the heart of the matter is they're not making up the horrors that have taken place. And it requires a horror to really lead a person to sacrifice what's a real basic thing, like the unity of one's sense of personality. It kind of stands to reason that it's going to take a, a killer set of events to bring about a person sacrificing unity in order to survive. We want to be just one, but that's given up in order to survive something terrible. So what would be some examples? I've maybe touched a few of them. <coughs> Let me just start with Billy Milligan, a very famous case. Um, 
Billy Milligan, this is from the 1970s, was a, a patient with multiplicity responsible for a series of sexual assaults on the Ohio State University campus in the 70s. And what was happening at the time was that somewhat, the girls were reporting, young women co-eds were reporting to the police that as they walked across the campus, suddenly this, this, sh this man's shape would come out of the bushes and run up behind them and feel them up, and the breasts and touch them and touch them and then run away. It, it wasn't outright rapes, it was, um, just little, it was just kind of like jumping all over them and fondling and fondling, fondling and running away. No, no real violence. That is violent to intrude upon your space like that, and intrude upon your body. But no, no injury, no permanent injuries, no raping was taking place. Okay. And so there had been like 10, 15, 20, 25 of these attacks. This person who was doing, committing the attacks would hide in the bushes. Police were looking for him. You know, everybody was freaked out, worried about somebody going to get killed. The police got a call then, an anonymous call. If you want to find who's responsible for the attacks, go to such and such an address, 24 Smith Street. You will find the person. Turned out it was one of the alters in this case that turned in the other alters who were committing the mm -hmm. sexual assaults. It was interesting what that was. Sometimes can happen. So he was brought in by the police. And then uh, he began to manifest a multiplicity and the police were worried he was faking it, so they called in Cornelia Wilbur, a psychiatrist who treated Sybil and was the, considered the world expert on the whole thing. She interviewed the patient in depth, Billy Milligan, and pronounced him the genuine article because he had all the, all the wherewithal that you need in order, to, in order to be given this diagnosis, including horrific, the survival of horrific sexual and other attacks in childhood. I'm going to tell you about one such attack. But I want you to imagine this horror story I'm about to tell you multiplied by a hundred, because a hundred more things like it happened to this young man as a boy. And this is the kind of thing that does happen or can happen. It belongs to an extreme that stretches our capacity to think cruelty like this could exist. But pretty much anything you can just get yourself to imagine does it. Somebody out there is doing it to somebody anyway. What would be the story? Billy Milligan, as I remember, the, and then later a book called I'm Billy Milligan or something was written, and I read that, I voraciously ate that up. It was all written up in People magazine at the time, and I have all the copies of that even still. But the um, story goes something like this, that Billy Milligan, I don't know where his mother was, but he was raised either by an uncle or maybe it was his father on a farm. Sing, just an only child with an older male caregiver, so to speak. Wait till you hear some of the care he did. And he was basically enslaved by the uncle to, to work and perform tremendously difficult chores from a very early age, milk the cows, feed the chickens, plant the corn, harvest the wheat, whatever it was that they had to do out there. And the, uh, the uncle, I'll, I'll say it was his uncle, it might have been his father, it doesn't matter, was sadistic and intolerant of the slightest infraction of the rules he imposed upon the boy. And any even look of rebellion in the boy's eyes would provoke vicious punishments. I'm going to tell you one such punishment. But multiply it by 100 and imagine what it would do to a child to have this kind of thing happening to him again and again and again. Let's say that Billy was late with the milking of the cows that day or knocked over the bucket so that half the milk spilled out. March into the field, young man, and carry this shovel with you. So the little boy, he would have been six years old maybe, five years old, marched into the field. He said, dig your own grave. And so the boy was forced in to dig like a four feet deep pit or something. And then once the pit was there, a back-breaking task all by itself for a little kid, get in the pit, lie down on your back. So the little boy lie down on his back. And then the father began to shovel the dirt on top of him, burying him alive. But the boy was given a straw to breathe through, a long straw. So, still, so finally the boy was completely buried under the earth with only the straw to breathe through, which he was using to breathe. They thought he was going to die, probably. And then the uncle urinates down the straw. You guys with me? How can you be with something like that? It's like cruelty upon cruelty, atrocity upon atrocity. Maybe you could understand that if you have something like this happen to you, which blows the child's mind completely, how's he even to assimilate and make sense of this even happening? He can't. 
The child that was finally dug up out of the ground, maybe it was a different child. Billy Milligan had a whole bunch of personalities, but one of them was generated by that. But it wasn't just that. There was a series of such atrocious, sadistic attacks that took place. Um, Sarah, in Indonesia, in child prostitution. This is a case. I'm going to pull in horror stories out. Give me three or four minutes to, to blow your mind and upset you. OK? Um, you can't understand this unless you can go to these terrible places of human cruelty. Forget it. Long story short, Sarah was a little girl, an only child, with two parents who were both doctors living in Indonesia. The parents decided that they were going to immigrate to America but leave their child for a year in Indonesia. So she, they hired caregivers to take care of this child and then planning to bring the child to America uh, after a year when they got established in their medical practices. That's the basic outline of the story. So they, they hired these people that they had reason to believe would be good caregivers. They turned out to be monsters who were wrapped up in rings of child prostitution, in, in international child prostitution in Indonesia. And there's, you might not know this, but there's a tremendously lucrative market for child prostitution. People will pay thousands to have a cooperative six-year-old or a seven-year-old. It's horrible to think about this, but welcome to reality, OK? Japanese businessmen, some of them, some of the clients were. So what the babysitters did was set about turning this child who had been turned over to their care for protection, supposedly, into a child prostitute who could then be cashed in on to make thousands and thousands of dollars. And one of the ways that they wanted to teach her to do it was to provide in, in a really cooperative and kind of an alluring and sexy manner uh, oral sex for these guys that would fly in to take advantage of children. And so they would so so the man would train her to per, you know to give him oral sex and part of that training including to swallow the ejaculation too and to do so enthusiastically and sexily okay and alluringly and attractively and this girl resisted that and thought that thought it was awful and didn't want to do that didn't want to do that so how did they get her to do it well, it's, a, and it's kind of a variation on Billy Milligan, now that I think about it. They had a big box. They said, get in the box. This, do you know what this box is? It's a coffin. It was the size of a coffin. And so they said, we're going to bury you alive. You are now dead. And we're going to take your parents and bury them also. And we're going to kill your whole, everyone in your family. But first, we're starting with you. So they got in the box, nailed the whole thing down. Bang, 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 until she was safely nailed in that coffin and then left her there for 12 hours, OK? She thought she was going to die, and this horrible fate was going to befall her parents. She was allowed to get out after 12 hours. But guess what, guess what the child was like that came out of that box? Like li a little Lolita, six years old, came out of that box, who would do anything for you, let her body be used in any way, and would squeal with joy in the process. Like one of the altars was a kind of six-year-old Lolita version of this, generated by this horrific, sadistic attack, OK? But it worked really well. And she went on to have about 11 or 12 personalities. And she was treated by a psychiatrist that I, I was the supervisor for for about five or six years. And uh, it was the most amazing thing. And it was, you know, maybe I'll tell you a little more about it. Let's stop there today, guys. So now that I've upset you.